very important result has a very, very central place in discrete time signal processing. This is called the Parsibles theorem. for sequences. And we are saying in effect that the dot product of the sequences is unchanged whether you look at it in time or in frequency. And there is one specific consequence of this dot product, which we shall see in a minute. That consequence follows if you take x 1 equal to x 2. We get summation n from minus to plus infinity mod, let us call this x. So, mod x n squared is 1 by 2 pi integral minus pi to pi mod x lambda squared d lambda. And here we have the same specific interpretation as we did for the sequence when we took both the sequences the same in the dot product. The dot product of a sequence with itself, of course, gives you the magnitude or the norm squared of that sequence. We said that when we talk about generalized vectors, sequences are generalized vectors. We, we do not like to use the word magnitude anymore as we do for finite dimensional vectors. We call it the norm. So, we say the norm and of course, I also to be very careful said that we should call it the L 2 norm. So, that was a technical point. Anyway, you know, for the moment, let us just call it the norm. So, this is the norm squared, you know, mod x n squared integrated over all n is the norm squared of the sequence. And that same norm squared can be calculated in the frequency domain. Of course, the physical interpretation is you have taken the dot product of the sequence with itself, so you are getting the magnitude squared. The magnitude squared is like the norm squared. And of course, the same norm squared is calculable from the frequency domain. Now, this gives a very beautiful interpretation. You see, what is the physical interpretation of this norm squared? It is easier to see if we look in the frequency domain. You know, what we have said in effect is, if you had a band limited signal, as you started off with when you sampled, then this is actually giving you the integral of the magnitude squared of the Fourier transform of that band limited signal. Now, you see suppose that band limited signal were a voltage signal and you applied that voltage across a 1 ohm resistance. The total amount of energy that that signal would dissipate in the 1 ohm resistance is the quantity that you have on the right hand side here. This quantity 1 by 2 pi integral minus pi to pi mod x lambda squared is the energy that would be dissipated is the energy dissipated. by a 1 ohm resistance, if x n is the sampled version let us continue, if x n is the sampled version of the band limited sigma. x t sampled at t equal to n for all integer n. x 
T is the voltage in volts across the 1 ohm resistor and the continuous time Fourier transform of x t is x omega which is equal to you see it is x omega for omega between minus pi and pi and 0 else. So, what we are saying is restrict the discrete time Fourier transform only to the interval minus pi to pi. In fact, here I introduce this idea of the underlying continuous time signal in general. Whenever you have a discrete time Fourier transform, restrict that discrete time Fourier transform to the interval minus pi to pi and cut off all the rest, make it all 0. What do you get? You get the, the original band limited signal, which was then sampled at the integer points to give you the samples x n. Is that correct? If you take this restricted Fourier transform band limited signal, if you sampled it at the integer point, you are sampling at a sampling rate of 1. What would happen in the Fourier domain? You would take the original spectrum, translate it by every multiple of 2 pi and add these translates. And therefore, you see what I, let me let me try and explain graphically. I am saying this is the DTFT. I am showing a couple of periods, whatever it be. This is of course periodic with period 2 pi. Now, restrict it this gives a continuous time band limited signal yes of course. Now, sample this continuous time signal at t equal to n, that is a sampling rate of 1. So, we get back the original DTFT, because when you sample at a sampling rate of 1, the effect is to shift the original spectrum by every multiple of 2 pi by 1, which is 2 pi on the frequency axis and these translates are added. So, you get back the original DTFT. So, this is the notion of the underlying continuous time signal and what I am saying is, Think of the underlying continuous time signal for the sequence x n. Let that continuous time signal be the voltage in volts applied across a 1 ohm resistance. The energy dissipated in that 1 ohm resistance is the integral mod x lambda squared d lambda over minus pi to pi. And the same energy is of course, obtained by taking the mod square of the samples and adding. So, both of them correspond to an energy. Let us go back to this. So, what we are saying is both of these quantities are now an energy. This is 
an energy as seen in frequency and the same energy is seen in time. So, we also call this the energy of the sequence for the obvious reason that I have just explained. And now, we also have an interpretation for just the integrand here. The integral of course, we have interpreted, it is the total energy, but we also have an interpretation for the integrand mod x lambda squared. The integrand is the way in which the energy is distributed over the frequency axis. So, it is called the energy spectral density, right. Since 1 by 2 pi integral minus pi to pi mod x lambda square d lambda is the energy mod x lambda squared is called the energy spectral density. Now, you know, this is not very different from what we understand density to be, you say in the case of a mass. How would you calculate the mass of an object, if you knew its density at different points? You would integrate the density over the volume on which the mass lies and that gives you back the mass. And of course, the density does not have to be uniform, right. So, here too, the density may not be uniform for all frequencies and essentially when you integrate the density, you get back the mass or the energy as the case might be, right. So, this is what, is this clear to everybody? So, we must, this is a very important notion in signal processing, the notion of energy spectral density. Now, of course, though this is not very commonly used, yes, there is a question. Yes. 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 Okay. So the question is, when you restrict, so I'll let me try and explain the question. The question is, when you restrict the seek the, the spectrum only to minus pi and pi, we are going from discrete time to continuous time. How are we drawing the parallel between discrete time and continuous time? Now you see. When you restrict the discrete time Fourier transform to between minus pi and pi, it cannot correspond to a sequence anymore. It cannot be the discrete time Fourier transform for sequence because it is no longer periodic with period 2 pi. So, it is in fact, it is it's a band limited Fourier transform. So, it's a, it corresponds to a band limited signal. Now, which band limited signal? That band limited signal which you had sampled at a sampling rate of 1 to get the sequence that you have. Why, why are you saying that it is that, that particular band limited signal? Because if you took that band limited signal and sampled it at a sampling rate of 1, what would happen in the frequency domain? You would take the original spectrum, translate by every multiple of 2 pi divided by 1, because the sampling rate is 1, sampling time is 1. So, 2 pi by 1 and move these this original spectrum by every multiple of 2 pi by 1 and add these translates. That is how you get the DTFT and of course, there is a 1 to 1 correspondence between the DTFT and the sequence. So, if you are getting back the DTFT by sampling this signal at a sampling rate of 1, then indeed you know there is a 1 to 1 correspondence between these samples and that underlying band limited signal. So, for every, for every DTFT, there is an underlying band limited signal that you can think of and that is often useful to do. Is that clear? Yes. So, his question is then what is the filter that you would apply? Well, you see you would apply the same, I, I assume you are asking what is the filter that you would apply to reconstruct the original signal from its samples. Is that the question? So, it is the same, I mean you know when you have a band limited signal, the filter that you would apply is a low pass filter with a cutoff at pi. So, you know, so it would, 
I mean if you want to reconstruct the signal from its samples, you could think of it as putting an ideal filter, an ideal low pass filter with a cut off at pi, right. That is what you would do. Any other questions? Yes. Well, so the question is would this analogy hold true only if the signal is band limited. Now, you see we are assuming there is no aliasing or the other way of thinking about it is the same samples can correspond to many signals. We know that that is what aliasing means. Out of them we are choosing the signal where there is no aliasing. There are of course, many signals to which these samples could correspond, but we are choosing that signal for which there is no aliasing, which must of course, be the band limited signal band limited to pi. Any other questions? These are good questions, yes. Yeah, so yes, there is a question. These things are only can be written mathematically, practically these things are not possible. So the question is this can be written only mathematically and there is no practical meaning that is not correct. You see we just gave a practical interpretation. We said that you know if you took the underlying band limited signal and looked at the energy across a 1 ohm resistance, you get the energy, is not it. So, it is not just a, it is not just a, it has of course, a mathematical meaning, but it also has a very important significance. So, the word energy actually is very meaningful, it is the energy in many situations. So, you know it is, it is so here the, in fact that is how the word energy is used, it has energy has implications in terms of energy as we understand it in physics. So, if you have a signal, whether it is a voltage signal, current signal, pressure signal, any other kind of signal which is sensed, this could actually correspond to the physical energy that is being delivered. That is not correct. So, it has a practical meaning. You see, one must remember, and this is a comment that I must make in general, it is very important to see the, the congruence between what we do on paper in terms of algebra and math and what happens in practice and that congruence is there, right. So, one must not assume that one is working out certain, certain things on paper and it has no practical meaning. It every, everything that we do here has a practical implication. Yes, any other questions? Yes. Okay, so, the question is every or any meaningful real signal is expected to have finite energy. Does it mean that every real signal must be band limited? Now, I will give you an analogy again to explain why the statement is not correct, right. You see, we, we of course, know that Indians would always live only for a finite time, right. We cannot live for, of course, there are legends that people live for 1000 years and so on. But I do not know of such things happening in the last century or maybe last millennium. So, let us assume that people have a lifetime of about 200 years at most, right, 200, 250 years let us say, okay. So, Indians do live for a finite time, is not it? Now, you know that is also true of all people in the world. We have not yet come across a person in the world who has lived for infinite time, is not it? So, now, you know, if you say that, now what are we saying, what are we trying to say here? We are saying, <coughs> human being. So, when let us let us bring an analogy between band limitedness and human beings, right. And again band limited. So, what, what is the thing we are, we are we are trying to we are seeing whether band limitedness and finite energy or reality or practicality is the same, right. Now, band limited it is like asking whether humanness and Indianness is the same. In both cases there is limited amount of life, right. Humanness and Indianness is not the same. Humanness is much bigger than Indianness, right, but both of them have the property that they live only for a finite time. Similarly, finite energy is broader than band limited. You can have a finite energy signal which is not band limited, right. You can have a, you can have a signal whose spectrum extends all over the frequency axis. You see, take for example, the signal which has a spectrum which decays like this. So, let this be the frequency domain and you have the spectrum e raise to the power minus mod omega. This is the spectrum of a signal, a continuous time signal. Let us call this 
capital X of omega. And of course, the energy in this is easily seen to be finite. Mod X omega squared d omega integrated from minus to plus infinity is of course, finite. It is integrated of indeed integral minus infinity to plus infinity e raised to the power minus 2 mod omega d omega. And this is a very easy integral to evaluate, is not it? It is finite. However, this is not band limited. This is like being human and band limited is like being Indian in that, right. Both of them of course, live for a finite time, but being human does not necessarily mean being Indian being finite energy does not necessarily mean being band limited. Of course, being band limited and if the spectrum does not have what are called you know I mean you are not taking a casual a, 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 you know an, an extreme example you know what is called um, a, I mean you know we are not taking a pathological example of a band limited signal where you, for example, you have an impulse a continuous time impulse or something in between then a band limited signal will of course, be finite energy in most cases, except of course, if there are impulses sitting inside, continuous time impulse, right. So, that is that is an important question and one must be clear that band limitedness and finite energy is not the same thing, finite energy is broader than band limitedness. It is an important question and I am glad it was asked. Yes, any other question? All right. So, then we have come to this important conclusion that mod x omega squared d omega is the, is the energy spectral density. Now, one comment, just as you can talk about the energy spectral density, technically you should also be able to talk about the energy time density. So, of course, we do not use this term too frequently. And the energy time density or the way the energy is spread over time is mod x n squared. Notionally, that is of course, correct, but very rarely do we use this term. The term energy spectral density is used more frequently than energy time density. Yes, there is a question. Yes. Yeah, so, the question is when we calculate the energy time density, we are averaging or we are taking the sampling rate to be 1. Is that the question? Yes, indeed, we have normalized, is not it? We have normalized the sampling rate. So, we have normalized the sample, we have normalized the time axis and we have also normalized the frequency axis. So, of course, if you when you go back to the actual times and frequencies, you need to bring in that normalization factor. So, we are working with normalized time and normalized frequency. All right. So, let us just take one example of a discrete time Fourier transform before we conclude. Take the sequence x n is equal to alpha raised to the power of n for n greater than or equal to 0 and 0 for n less than 0. Now, we define the sequence u n which is 1 for n greater than or equal to 0 and 0 for n less than 0. This is a sequence which we call the unit step. The sequence unit step is going to use is going to come frequently in our discussions. Interestingly, the unit step itself does not have a discrete time Fourier transform. The discrete time Fourier transform of the unit step would not converge. But multiply the unit step by an exponential as we are doing here. As we can see, x n can be written as alpha raised to the power of n u n. And if mod alpha is less than 1, then we can calculate the discrete time Fourier transform of x n. And that is very easy to do. It turns out to be summation n going from minus infinity to plus infinity x n e raise to the power minus j omega n, which is summation 
n going from 0 to infinity alpha raise the power of n e raise the power minus j omega n. That is a very easy integral to evaluate. It is a geometric progression with common ratio of alpha e raise the power minus j omega. And the modulus of this common ratio is the modulus of alpha. And since modulus alpha is less than 1, this is a convergent sum and it converges obviously to 1 by 1 minus alpha e raise the power minus j omega. So, this is the discrete time Fourier transform of a one sided exponential. I may also mention that if you have a finite length sequence, if x n is finite length, x n is non zero only for n between n 2 and n 1 n 1 is strictly n 1 and n 2 are finite. They can be positive or negative. It does not matter. Then of course, the d t f t of x n always exists. That is easy to see because it is a finite summation. In fact, it is not very difficult also to see that if you took x n here to be the impulse response of a linear shift invariant system, then that system is bound to be stable. That is because the absolute sum of this impulse response is necessarily going to be finite, cannot be infinite. There is only a finite number of samples and of course, we assume each sample is finite. So, a finite length sequence always has a discrete time Fourier transform. We have given an example of an infinite length sequence which also has a discrete time Fourier transform. In the next lecture, we shall take an example of an infinite length sequence which does not have a discrete time Fourier transform. In fact, we did it before, but we will take it again and we will also use that to build a new transform called the Z transform. With that then, we conclude the lecture today.